not playing around. It's kind of dactylic Demeter. I like dactylic <laughs> Demeter. Hi, and welcome to DTLT Today. I'm Jim Groom, and I have with me today a professor and awesome person, Claudia Emerson, who will be talking with us today about her work. I know Claudia, and let me just give you a quick introduction, because Claudia, you may know her as a poet, a Pulitzer Prize-winning poet for The Last Wife, done all sorts of stuff, but I know her as an awesome teacher. Uh, since I came here to DTLT, um, she's worked on all sorts of cool ways to integrate technology into the classroom, whether it be the literary journals class, which is awesome, the ether shop, which has over 300 reviews now of contemporary mm -hmm. poems. So she's done some cool stuff. So not only a great writer, but also a great teacher. And it's my pleasure to have Claudia here today. Thanks. Hi, I'm very happy to be here. So Claudia, I want to congratulate you. Recently, you've got a Guggenheim fellowship. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that's all about? Yeah, I'm really excited to have gotten it. Um, I received the fellowship for work on a book I'm just beginning. I'm just three slash four poems into it. Sure. Its working title is The Opposite House. And I'm stealing the title. I may change it later, but I'm stealing the title from an Emily Dickinson poem um, that begins, There's Been a Death in the Opposite House as Lately as Today. And I'm wow. on the brink of, and, and I'll say with apology, I'm a, kind of a different poet, not from everybody, but from some, and then I tend to be project driven from book to book. I'll mostly think of what the whole book might be and then go at it with a shape in mind. Gotcha. And so the book I just finished that'll be out in January from Louisiana State University Press is called Secure the Shadow. Gotcha. And it's a book that deals with both cultural historical looks at ritualized ways of mourning and um, uh, death and the industry of death and then also deals with the, the really personal and devastating deaths of my brother and father that happened within a three-year period, which was half my immediate family. And I heard there was also, from what I understand of that book, it also deals with photography to some degree. That's right. And it, that kind it, of yeah. challenging and looking at death. Yeah, the phrase secure the shadow comes from the 19th century daguerreotypist advertising slogan that goes, secure the shadow ere the substance fade, let nature imitate what nature has made. Encouraging people, mainly in the middle class, to have their loved ones photographed after they had died because often people wouldn't have any images of them at all. Okay. And so they're, um, they range from sort of grotesque images to absolutely beautiful ones as photography made the change from documentary to art form, fine arts. <laughs> so some of the early ones were taken just to get an image of the loved one so that someone could paint a portrait. And then gotcha. later they became you know, more beautified to look like the Sleeping Beauty. And were the images taken of dead people? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. They or weren't. sometimes of live people posed with the dead. There was also another practice of um, a year after the death, you would be um, posed with the postmortem photograph, if that makes sense. There's a great collection uh, Dr. Stanley Burns uh, has called Sleeping Beauty. I heard him interviewed years ago on NPR, and I never forgot it, and I ended up buying the volume. Uh, when I was researching this book and, and wrote some from there and some I have a small uh, collection myself of postmortem. And so he has uh, a collection images. of these sleeping, yes, of these right. dead images. That's correct. You wow. can see some of them online too. But um, I was really interested in that but fast forward to how that fits into the Guggenheim. Book by book I've tended to go not personal, not personal, then late wife was very personal, then figure studies which is about the girls school, not personal yeah. at all. That's where the medical Venus appears. Then I went to Secure the Shadow. I tried to blend personal and historical, sure. other cultural. And now I want to go not personal. So that leads to the Guggenheim, which I titled the, the project um, or the Poetics of Preservation, Form and Formula, because I was interested in, again, leaping off of the postmortem images to the practice of modern mummification. And <laughs> Which is the <laughs> poetics of preservation is kind of, I mean, that's a bit sick, isn't it? I mean, like the way you're like, you well, know, like it's this idea of like you're dealing with like these crazy mummified I figures. Know, I know, but But the weird thing about it too was um, I don't think I'm crazy when I'm writing the poems and stuff like that, but when you apply for a Guggenheim, which I had not done before, and it was a different application because you write 
what you're going to do, what your project will be. Sure. And so um, after I typed up all this stuff about Secure the Shadow and what it had done, and I had to c contextualize how you jump from the, the 2D images of the, the photographs to then a real 3D mummified figure, I, you know, type, merrily typing this thing up according to the guidelines, and I went home and told my husband, I sound like a raving lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, we have some images of the, is it called the medical Okay, theater? now this is not the, the figure that we're about to look at. Um, she was sort of, okay, not that one. Um, I became interested in the history of um, medical uh, teaching models, anatomical sure. models. Uh, around the time in between the, the segment of finishing the late wife book um, and then beginning figure studies, which has a more feminist slant on it. That deals so, with your time at mm -hmm. the uh, boarding school, right? Correct. So sh the medical Venus is a figure that I want to see finally when I get to go to Italy. She's in Florence. And awesome. so I thought I've already written the poem about her, which is in figure studies called the medical Venus, but she is a life-size anatomical model. And the, the mistake I almost made with her was not seeing her in context, in her physical context, in the museum in Italy. And as much as we can do with distance technologies, and I'm all a fan of that, as you know, sure. I've, I've not traveled very much. And one of the origins, or one of the original uses for Guggenheim fellowships um, was in travel. And so I, I thought, you know, I don't want to make the same mistake again. And the mistake I almost made was seeing her as beautiful, an image of immortality, all these things that were sort of romanticized by seeing her not in the context. And if we can look at, there's some images of her. Okay, see, to me that's still beautiful, but I know I'm sick. So. Yes, yes. But if you, <laughs> that's if now you becoming apparent. <laughs> <laughs> but if you keep going forward, um, there is another image or two later. Yeah, another one. Yeah, there she's exhibited in a glass casket, but she's in a room, if you back up one, Tim, uh, actually, well, that's another one of the models exhibited near her, which I, there she is. She's in a room, or she was exhibited in a room with other models that weren't so serene looking, yeah. that they had been constructed differently, and as I began to read people's reactions to the exhibit, a lot of people saw her as looking drugged. Um, uh, overtly sexual when she didn't need to be as a yeah. teaching model. And so I saw her utterly differently as... Like a museum artifact that's almost, right? right? Yeah. And it's totally mm -hmm. different than what you might suggest. Yeah. So I ended up pulling her out of the Late Wife book where I had hooked her up sort of with um, uh, Audubon who, who would um, kill many, many birds in order to create his images. To create any of these anatomical models, they had to dissect over 200 bodies from the hospital wow. on their way from the hospital to, to the graveyard. But anyway, um, I just, I, I admitted this in the Guggenheim application, I don't want to make the same mistake again of not seeing the, the mummies, um, that the ones I'm interested in are um, in catacombs underneath Palermo. So yeah, let's sh let's shoot to that now. So now you're going to be going. Actually, not I don't. Only I, don't I don't think I have an image of, you, of that. You're going to be going to Florence. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. So you're going to be going from Florence down to Sicily. Yeah. Or uh, either way, some, back yeah, and some, forth. Yeah, some, some, mm-hmm. And then you're going to see these real people who were embalmed by, I imagine is this kind of like the king of all embalmers, this yeah. guy, what is his name, Cecilia? Uh, yeah, uh-huh. And I, I think that's right. I didn't bring my um, uh, list of, of names, but there was a lot of secrecy about the formula. Yeah. That he for, used. I, actually, there was a lot of secrecy about the formulas for the wax and the dye from the anatomical model, which, again, all linked up in my research. Wow. Um, in finding out about these formulas for what became the most successful of those modern mummifications, right at a time when it was uh, phasing out. You know, people weren't going to do it anymore. Sure. But um, I was fascinated, too, and here's why I don't know what I'll find uh, and what it'll be like to see um, uh, a couple of these figures, but um, why a, a family would choose that over photography. I mean, what is the yeah. urgency of the grief that you would would do that. Um, and again, I know, I can say that this isn't personal, but it's still sort of spiraling off uh, my own experiences with, in my family. With that. And, yeah. And what we do now is um, we still embalm and preserve the bodies. We just don't keep them around to look at them. Well, there's right? also, there's a, I mean, from what I saw, Rosalia, is that her name? Yeah, that's the one. She's yeah. the young child. She's two years old. Oh, 
that was preserved. In the 20s. And you see pictures of her in the 95. She looks perfect. Yeah. She looks great. As a matter of fact, they, um, she's in a little uh, glass, uh, lead-lined sort of casket with a glass top on it. Sure. And they brought scientists in to x-ray her and make sure she was real because she looked so fake. She was so well done. She looks fake. So I don't know where the poetry will lead me. I've just have, yeah. I just have drafts so, let me ask, so far. Let me ask you, as you said, for each book you come up with a form and then you fill it with a particular. What yeah. is your form for this one? Like, How are you thinking about preservation and death in relationship to some of the poetics you want to get at? Um, two things are coming to mind, and I'm not sure how it will play out, but the early drafting of some of the other poems is just loose blank verse, uh, unrhymed pentameter lines, line by line by line, um, kind of in a rush. Sure. And I'm coming off of a variation of that now, but part of it might also return to a sonnet sequence, which I've used before. I'm not sure about that. It's sort of appealing to me, but I, I'm not positive. But the shape of the book, um, I have um, what I call the table of conceits or ideas, and it looks to me it's going to be another one that'll be probably in about three sections. Wow. And right now, everything is being drafted in third person. I don't think I'll have a voice in, in any of it at all. That, that's, I'm so you're pulling yourself totally out. I get tired of that. You know, I Are get you going to be the person who goes around and watches them and looks no. at them? No. You won't know. Well, it's me, but. <laughs> you won't know that. <laughs> yeah. But you'll have that sense. So I go through these the phases of I want to take out the first person. So is so. it going to be seen from the point of view of anyone who's Any, going to, yeah. s to Sicily to see them? Right. You just won't know. I'm a face. So it's one of those funny things. I, 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 I think that's what I'm going to do. And I know if a, if a student handed in a poem like that for a workshop, I would say, now, who is doing the speaking? That's right. So I know I'm off on a funny foot with it, but I'm just going to go with it. That's what it Well, is this similar to the book you're doing on death and photography in that you are half there and half not? Yeah. You're not totally pulling That's yourself right. out? That's right. That one, I'm, it, I'm very much there in part of the book. Yeah. And then other parts, I'm not. So I feel like I was working myself out wow. in, in the writing of that book. So do you find it since late wife harder to pull yourself out? Because figure studies, that I'm really is premised a lot, though, yeah. on your experience at the boarding but school. But I'm not in it. But you don't show yeah. up at all. I don't show up, except as um, personify. I mean, a, a collective we. I have uh, neighbor women gossiping about um, other women, and I have um, children talking about isolated women. So well, let me ask you another question, because I'm fascinated. You're a Southern writer, yeah. right? You're from Chatham, Virginia. Right. Chatham, Virginia has played a large part in the work you do. Now, with the medical Venus or with this work you're doing now, does the South or Chatham play it all into it? Yes. It does. How? Um, I'm not absolutely certain how neat the connections are going to be. Sure. But let me think of, a, uh, of an example. Um, one poem that I've drafted has to do, and these are, th these are little narratives with um, uh, a woman I loved very much who, uh, she was the mother of one of my high school friends, and she died from a brain tumor. And a story she told, and if Kathy Sagmeister Fox is watching, uh, I'll yes. send you Hello, the Gabby. draft at some point. <laughs> but um, the story she told of meeting her husband, who was a pilot in World War II in Germany, was they were in an underground train station. There was a blackout in Berlin, and um, uh, my friend's mother had left a flashlight on in the pocket of her raincoat. And her husband strode up to her in the train station and said, turn that light on. And I've done something with um, what happened with her brain when the tumor was growing, and she forgot language, and she forgot how to read. And, and not forgot, but it went away, right, That's as right. the brain was eclipsed. And then you get down to a figure striding up to you in a dark tunnel saying, turn your flashlight off, you know, sort of an obvious. But isolated figure, you don't know who's doing yeah. the, the telling. Well, what's interesting, too, just from the story you told, is that happened in Europe, right? In Germany? That's right. And you're going to oh, Europe. Yeah, you this is your about, first yeah. trip, right? Yes. And so I wonder if, like, you know, there'll be a return to Europe for kind of, if that will affect this book of poetry at all. Because well, it's this is your first to. time going to Europe, right? Yeah. Italy's awesome. You're going to have a blast there. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, I mean, well, how that's going to, that tradition's going to play in a It's bound bit. to. And my mentor in poetry, you've heard me talk about Betty Adcock. Sure. Um, was giving me a lot of advice during the Guggenheim application. She was one of um, my good friends for years in this, and she had said, 
you know, don't be so project driven with this one. You're going to be in a different culture and you yeah. have to be open to what's going to happen there. But yeah, it's funny when you ask me about the Chatham though with it, I do have um, a poem idea that's very rural yeah. um, that I'm calling First Kill about the local paper and every, sometimes in the spring depending on what hunting season, but every fall the paper comes around and suddenly the football team pictures are there but all the pictures of these children who have killed their first deer or turkey or whatever. And, and they have these little templates that are kind of like anybody's wedding. But it always tells what kind of gun it was and how many points on the book and whose property it was. And a picture of the, some little kid, you know, grinning, holding up this the dead animal. So that's part of the book, too. So how that fits with a mummy and, you know, I'm not sure. Well, that's a beautiful vision, too. Yeah. I love that idea of the first kill. Don't you think people are just going to snap this up? You know, they can't wait to buy it for Christmas gifts. Well, I like it, too. I mean, the taxidermy <laughs> part of it, right? I yeah. mean, like that whole preservation. I mean, I think it's an awesome theme. And, you know, the stuff you're doing, why I, like, I invited you first and why I trip out on you is you're one of the few people who, like, love to talk about their work as it's happening. I don't find it um, – some people think it's bad luck, and I yeah. think you can talk something too much if you're not working on it. But it's always helped me to um, – Chat it, chat about it. Sometimes things will uh, surprise myself. Just it's part of yeah. the process for me. And I was saying to Martha too that part of this poetics of preservation, photography is preservation. Yeah. Um, these mummies might be that anatomical model is a kind of preservation of knowledge and research. But so is poetry. Yeah. Poetry is also a preserving. And but the thing that's always alive is the person who's going to view it, the person who will read it, the living eye moving around the figure or through the poem. I think that's where it's all in conversation um, with, with, with all the mediums in conversation with each other. That's awesome. And it's a great way to pull it back, that preservation of the form, too. Yeah. Which you are a, a huge scholar of. I mean, you love the form, meters. Yeah. You teach a class on I'm meters. I'm teaching a class on it right now. And we, we just started out the semester with writing free-form essays about what is form and what is measure because um, students will be resistant to English meters and forms and say that they're male, Eurocentric, too restrictive. I'm a free verse kind of gal <laughs> and all that stuff. Free and yet, love. Yeah. But when you sit down to s write anything that you're calling a poem, you're in participation with centuries before you. Yeah. And the forming of language in, in that highest order is so that we can remember it before we had text, right? Yeah. You're still in participation with that, whatever and Whatever. that's what's interesting about what Betty says, you going back to Europe, or back to Europe, not that you've ever been, but that idea of going back to those centuries of form yeah. and what that might mean for this book. What that might mean, I don't know. I love ruins, too, so I think I'll have a You'll good time. You'll love it. You have a great time in Italy. <laughs> yeah. Well, Claudia, thanks for being on DTF. Yeah, thanks today. very You're much. Awesome. I really enjoyed it. We love right. having you. We're going to have you back. All right. When okay. you come back from Italy, we're going to be like, what was it like? Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. DTLT thank you. today. Thank you very much. All right.